Discord. Okay, nice. Oh, wait, I'm not sharing my screen. That's important. Oh, let's see. We should have nine. Yeah. One more. Oh, perfect. All right, perfect. Uh, we'll just get started. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> wow, that was wow. All right, yeah, there we go. All right, All let's right. see how everyone's fall break was. Yeah, so now it's just creating like I should have joined. Yeah. Um, Aww. So the okay, most people was good. That's that's great. Sorry for the person who said we had a break. Uh, I feel you. <laughs> yeah, I do feel you on that. I had a lot of work this break as well. Um, okay. All right. Let's see. Let's see if any any astute Android developers among us. Yeah, we did cover this a little last lecture. Yes. No, go ahead. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Most of us got it. So constraint layout is the layout that we're going to use the most throughout Android development. It's very versatile. It's very performant. So very nice. Okay. Ooh. Oh, good. Great. Okay. No one's panicking. It was not due yesterday. Don't worry. It's due October 17th. So you still have a good bit of time. Glad everyone got that. Very nice. Okay. Where can we find the office hour times? Let's see. <laughs> yes, on our Google Calendar. So I posted an announcement on Ed discussion about that. Uh, if you want to get access to our Google Calendar, you can find that on Ed. Uh, and I also sent it out in the welcome email. So, okay. Whoever put volume props. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, last question. Just a little vocab vocab question. Yeah, so those are views. And interestingly, composables is also a correct answer. Uh, that's because there's a new, like newer UI framework for Android called Jetpack Compose. We're gonna go over a little bit about that today, but um, if you chose composables, that could also be thought of as like a building block for your, your UI. But with Android Native, what we've been going over, views is the main building block. So components, you might be thinking more about like React, but that's not really what we call them in Android. And for activities, remember that activities are the screens of our Android applications. So they're not really building blocks of a UI, they're more so, that would more so just be like an entire screen, right? So. Nice. Okay, so it looks like we all did pretty well on that. Uh, here's the leaderboard. Unfortunately, I don't know like any of these net IDs to names. So, uh, if you if you're first, great job. I don't know who you are. Uh, <laughs> but intros later. Yeah, probably. If we have time. If we have time, yes. Okay, but we have a very important and fun lecture to get to. So excited. So. Uh, yeah, this is lecture two. We did the attendance Kahoot. So announcements, uh, make sure that you're enrolled in the student center if you want to take this course for credit. That is very important. So do that. Uh, if you have any like trouble enrolling or need our help in any way, let us know. Also, homework one is coming up on October 17th, which it looks like you are all aware of from the Kahoot, which is very good. So just make sure that um, like you're able to get that done on time. Uh, okay, so we're going to get into section one, which is view groups. These are also known as layouts. So the question is like, we have a lot of views that we're trying to arrange 
in our Android application, right? And how do we know like which view, which views are going to be positioned where? So that question is answered by view groups, right? So there's a few different types of layouts. I'm going to go over like a few of the most common ones that you'll see in Android development. But for this course, we're mainly going to use constraint layout, which I'll get to. But some really simple layouts uh, is a linear layout. This is really common in development in general, where basically you're going to have a layout like defined by this outer box here. And all the elements that you put inside of this box will either be arranged together horizontally or vertically, right? So those are the two main types of linear layouts. And it allows you to like really simply just create these layouts and arrange your views like on top of each other or next to each other. Um, okay. So sometimes you want to do things more, you want to do things a bit more complicated. And this is like a little bit of review from last lecture, but basically the idea is constraint layouts. So you want to be able to position views according to other views. So like, for example, I might have like a could be, uh, like a text field, right. And then C could be a submit button. And maybe I want my text field to always be above my submit button, right? So I could tell, I could basically tell my submit button that its top constraint is the bottom of the text field, right? Uh, and then the text field, right? Its bottom constraint could be the top of the submit button. So these kind of go both ways. And you're going to get to see this in like more low level during the demo today. But uh, this is like a really important layout. Uh, and it, it basically just works by setting the constraints. So like each side, uh, each side of a view, you're going to constrain it to another view. So does anyone like have any questions about constraint layout? Because I want to make sure this is a really, really important concept. So, okay. So we'll get to the next one, which is relative layout. So this is actually pretty similar to constraint layout. Uh, but the thing is, that constraint layout requires you to fulfill like each constraint, basically. Like you have to define uh, each of these like points, each of these constraints on every view for a constraint layout to work or else it'll be really buggy. But for a relative layout, you can sort of get like a bit lazier and you can just basically say like, oh, I want this view below this other view, but I'm not gonna specify like where I want it to be horizontally, right? So you can get a little bit lazier with that, but the issue is that uh, relative layout like tends to not perform as well as constraint layout. So uh, I do recommend that like you use constraint layout when you're developing. Uh, but it's just good to have like exposure to these different types of layouts. So if you're reading the code of an Android app, you'll be able to understand like, oh, this is a relative layout. I can like read through this XML and understand what's going on. So that's that's it for layouts. It's actually pretty basic. But the next big part of what we're going to be talking about is inputs. So this is obviously a hugely important topic in app development, right? Like if I have a user log in, I need a text input. If I have a user click a button, right? That is an input. The user is inputting to the device and we need a way to respond to that. So that's why inputs are super important. And there are basically a ton of different like preset ways that the user can input and interact with the app. Okay. So like all of these are on the slide. You're not really expected to like memorize all of these, right? But these are just like important ways that uh, the user can interact with the app. So um, typically like this edit view, um, this, this is more specifically like an edit text and it lets you basically just type in whatever text that you want and each of these views, each of these input views, right? They're building blocks to our UI, kind of like we discussed earlier. So these are just like blocks that you can put into your UI and you can use, you can interact with them in code to get like what the user has selected. So some of the other ones that we have are seek bar. So that's number two right there. It gives you that range of values, like a nice slider. There's also checkbox. So you can use a checkbox to like select multiple options, right? I think you've all like interfaced with these types of um, like toggles and inputs at some point when you're using software, because these are really common. So you're also going to have radio buttons where maybe you want only one of them to be selected at any given time. Uh, that's, that's like a pretty nice use case. There's also toggles, right? So like a true or false value. And then 
uh a spinner so that one is like kind of an unintuitive name i like to think of it more as like a drop down menu so you click on that drop down menu and it brings up like different um like different options for you to choose from and then depending on what the user chooses that is the user's input so yeah these are all like different ways to take user input and i think like i've probably had to use pretty much like all of these at some point like while as a, as a software developer so yeah, these are really important. Um, so we're going to talk about the seek bar a little bit more in depth because homework one uh, or, or like the first the first sign that we're giving you relies on using the seek bar to do something. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to customize it as well as like today's demo is also going to be on the seek bar. So yeah, uh, like seek bar, like most other input views is highly customizable. So you're able to change the color, the maximum progress level. So even though like that slider, it may not look like it, but behind the scenes, there's actually a number associated with this slider here. And you're going to get to see that during the demo today. But like, let's, I think the default value is that the maximum seek bar is 100, the maximum seek bar value. So that, for example, might be like 40 or something like that, right? But uh, Android, the Android framework lets you change that maximum progress level to anything you want. So if it was a thousand, then that might be more like 400 or something like that. So behind the scenes, uh, this in the seek bar does have like numbers associated with it, and that's how you can know the progress of um, like of the of the seek bar, right? So you can also change like the icon that's associated with it the style, like including the colors and the animation. So uh, this seek bar is like highly customizable. And so you'll also find that like a lot of the other views in Android, they have these like defaults that can sometimes be a bit aggressive, but you can customize them to make them look basically however you want. So yeah. Okay. So now the next question is we've had like all these examples of user input, right? But it's kind of useless if we just have the XML for it and we can't actually interact with them in our code. Okay. So we're, so like the way that we're going to do this is set up event listeners. All right. So we have our button and we're going to set up an on click listener. And we're basically going to say run any code that's inside of those two curly braces whenever the button is clicked. So obviously this can be really useful because you can put any code that you want to in here. Right. So yeah. Um, I think I think that's about it. So before we move on though, can anyone tell me like what this first line is doing? So we went over we went over that a bit yesterday, uh, or not yes, last class in the demo. Anyone know like what is that first line of code doing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so there's a button in your XML, right? That's a view. You have a button set up in your XML, and then, uh, and then so you have that button set up in your XML. But the thing is that if we try to set an on-click listener for that button, uh, Android usually wouldn't know like which button you're referring to. So you use this find view by ID method right here, and what this method does is it like you you know that the button has a certain ID, right? In this case, it's button, and you're finding that exact view, and then you're storing that view in a value, right? And then you're setting the on-click listener. So just to make sure we like all have a really clear understanding of that. So does this, oh yeah. And also the toast is basically just um, like printing a message to the screen. It's it's pretty basic. Um, and this is just like the syntax for it is, is a bit weird, but all that's really doing is just printing hello world to the screen. So does anyone have any questions about uh, this code right here? Okay. So yeah, it looks like we can move on. Um, we're talking, I'll just like uh, introduce homework one a bit more. So as I said, like our goals is to become familiar with seek bar and other ways of taking user input. So like in this assignment, you're going to be asked to change the like color based on the seek bar value. And some of this stuff, like create, like getting a color from a value or like converting it to HSV from uh, RGB, right? That's going to be like pretty difficult because you don't like you don't really know 
uh, exactly how to do that, right? So this is where you're going to consult the Android documentation. So like as a software developer, uh, I'm pretty much like consulting documentation for like the frameworks I work with, like pretty much every time I develop, right? So I, I think it's really good for like all of you to like have the skill of being able to read documentation and understand it and then like apply it to your code. So if you're stuck with like trying to figure out like how can I get this like hue saturation, um, what's the last one? Do you know? <laughs> hue saturation something, value. Hue saturation value, right? How do I get this to be a color, right? That's something that like the documentation has and it's like really in depth. So that's not like an Android development specific problem, but it's more of like a coding problem that you'll need the Android documentation for. Um, and like Stack Overflow, right? It's like an incredibly useful resource. Of course, like no plagiarism. Um, like don't just like directly copy and paste from Stack Overflow, but like if you're if you're stuck, right? These resources can help you. And it's really important that you know how to effectively utilize them as a developer. Um, and I guess the other note is come to office hours if you're struggling. Uh, we're here to help. Uh, and some of the office hours actually got moved to Zoom because some of our room our room requests got rejected. So we're hoping that like eventually we'll be able to get those uh, in the rooms. But I would say just before you go to office hours, check the Google Calendar. It's all up to date with the locations of the office hours. So just to make sure that, uh, yeah, you, you don't go to a room and then realize it's on Zoom or something like that, right? So, yeah, okay. Um, and then a little bit of like an additional section is intro to Jetpack. So at the beginning, I mentioned about how we have, there's this new framework called Jetpack Compose. And this framework is really powerful and allows us to do things in Android like way simpler than Android native. I still think that learning Android native first is a really good, gives you a really good foundation for understanding like how to code mobile apps and just like generally how like front end development works. But um, Jetpack is really powerful and really simple as well. So I want to give you all like a brief overview and also the tools to like play around with Jetpack Compose in your free time um, and, and just like mess around, see what you can do because it's really great to know this stuff. Um, so first we'll talk about what are composables and from the Kahoot, right? I mentioned that they're essentially the building blocks of your UI. So they describe how your UI is going to look, right? So like this payment methods here, this could be a composable that essentially like comes up from the bottom of the screen and like shows the different payment methods. So you can, you can think of them as just like views from, uh, Android native, right? And at composable tag will create composable functions. So the unique thing about Jetpack Compose is that instead of using XML, you actually use everything is declared in Kotlin functions and all the UI is built from Kotlin. So you have to have a way to differentiate like what is UI versus what is Kotlin code. And the way that you do that is with this at composable tag. So yeah, you can have these like complex UIs that are made from like composables that are composed from more composables. So this, I think actually we go into that a little bit later, but um, in terms of how to like arrange things in Jetpack Compose, a row places ho all columns horizontally. So it's a bit like linear layout where you have like your column that places items vertically, your row places items horizontally, and then box allows for like the items to overlap with each other, right? So uh, you're mainly gonna be using column and row when you develop in Compose. But uh, yeah, I just want to give like an overview of how this stuff works in Compose. So like, here's an example of a Compose layout. So you might, each of these, uh, these like elements that are horizontally arranged might be contained in individual rows. And then you have a column that essentially just vertically aligns all the rows. So that's like an example of what a composable layout might look like. Uh, yeah, and if you want to try it yourself, uh, you can always like go back to this slide, but basically the way that you do it is you create a new project and instead of choosing empty views activity, you're going to choose empty activity uh, with that like compose logo in the center. And then you can start placing composables uh, right there in like in the main activity. But uh, yeah, I don't want to go over this for too long because our course is more based around Android native, but there's a nice overview. Cool. Okay, so now I'm going to get into the demo for today. So to show you what we're going to be working on, uh, let's see. 
So our goal for by the end of this demo, we want this app here. So it you have a seek bar and you have this button that says increment. And what it's going to do is when you press increment, it's going to increment this value by whatever value is stored in the seek bar. So remember I said seek bar has that integer value under the hood, right? So right now it's like 13% of the way to completion. You can see that it's incrementing the value by 13 every press. Uh, and then we could drag this up and it'll increment it by a higher value, right? So yeah, you're already able to build something like pretty interesting. Uh, and I'm going to get started. So uh, I like suggest that you all follow along. Uh, if you end up like fall falling behind, uh, Sophie can help you. But also like, don't worry about it too much. It's like, just make sure that you can always refer to this code later. Just make sure that you're understanding like the concepts and why I'm doing what I'm doing. So first, uh, just make a new project with empty views activity. And I'm gonna call it demo two new, okay? So just to make sure everyone got that, you go to file, new, new project, empty views activity, and then demo to new. So uh, click finish, and we should have an empty project. Perfect, okay. So now I want you to all go to activity main.xml. And so I tend to code XML um, in a bit of a different way. So I think Sophie was showing you guys the palette where you can drag things into your XML, right? Uh, I prefer to do it this way where you actually get the code, the code up for you. So you don't have to do it this way, but I just find it like a bit easier to work with because I can use the autofill really easily to add different elements. So yeah, let me see, remind myself of what the app is supposed to look like, right? So we have a seek bar, a counter text and an increment. So first let's just add, let's just add our seek bar. So the, if you want to do this quickly with, um, with the XML, you can just type, start typing seek bar and press tab and it will already like fill in for you. And then what I just did there was I set the layout width and height to wrap content. So that basically just means that like the seek bar will only be as big as uh, like the minimum size for the seek bar, which is right here, but we can increase the width. So we can do that by doing like 400 DP just as a test. And that seems to be a pretty good size. So now we can set up the constraints, right? So it might be easier to do that in this window. So um, we can drag these values around and that will constrain the seek bar to the center. So you just drag each constraint to essentially where you want the object to go. Um, yeah. So you also want to do the side constraints as well. Uh, it seems like I'm having a bit of trouble. So I'm going to go into the XML. So I'm going to say start to start of um, parent. So what this says is it's basically taking the first constraint and constraining this, constraining it to the start of the parent, right? So the start is always like to the left and the end is always to the right. So then we're also going to do end to end of parent. So should be pretty intuitive. Uh, it basically just constrains it to the center, right? And if you want to do that without XML, you can always just like drag this to where you want it to go, right? Um, so there's our seek bar. Then the next thing I'm going to do is we have our, so we have our seek bar. We also want to add our number, right? So I think I'm actually going to decide to position it a little bit differently. So I'm going to add a text view. Um, and remember, you can always like drag in text view from the palette if you want to. So text view. And uh, we're going to give this like a default text of, I'm just going to say counter. So we can just see it in the, in the XML, in the preview here. Uh, and then you'll see that it gives this like little warning. Uh, wait, did you go over strings.xml last time? Yeah. Okay. So it like as a shortcut, instead of going into strings.xml, you can just press extract string resource and it will do it for you basically. So if you hover over and press extract string resource, uh, it will do that for you. Very nice. And then you're just going to add in your constraints afterwards, right? So I feel like it makes more sense to have the counter on top. So I'm going to put this constraint here and then put it up so it's nice and center and then do my horizontal constraints as well. So uh, put this in here. 
Perfect. Okay. So we have our counter as well. So the next element that we're going to make is our button. So again, I just prefer to do it this way, but you can use the palette. So button, wrap content. Um, we're going to say that the text is increment. And again, we want to extract the string resource. So the shortcut to do that is just clicking extract string resource and letting it do it for you. Very nice. Um, and then what we're going to do is add our constraints. So you can just constrain this to the bottom and back to the top and then do it on the sides as well, right? So yeah, I, I feel like that basically makes sense. So that's that's actually, well, actually we're almost done our XML. So the one thing that we need to do is, so if we wanted to access this button in our code, what do you think we're missing here? Do you see like any property button that we might be missing that we need if we wanna access it in our code? Can you say that again? Uh so I don't I don't think that's what we're going for here. Because so remember when we did that? Um here, it's like here's a hint. So remember from the slideshow, we got our button, we stored our button in a value, and we had to find that button inside of the XML, right? What did we what property of the button did we use to find it in the XML? The ID, exactly. So that's what we need here, right? We need to add an ID. So we're gonna add, we're just gonna say that this is increment button, okay? Uh, and then we also need to access our text because we wanna change the text based on how we increment it, right? So the way that we're gonna do that is ID, and we're gonna say that this is increment text, okay? Uh, is that big enough for everyone to see? See if I can make this bigger. Um, I don't know. Hopefully that's fine. <laughs> I'm pressing command plus and it's not making it bigger. Um, oh, increase font size. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, that should be a little bigger, but I don't want to cut off any of the code. So, um, yeah. Okay, cool. So this is our XML setup it is basically done. So now we're going to get to the coding part. So I'm going to be switching away from the screen. Uh, Sophie should be able to help you if you need to get caught up on any of the XML. So, okay, perfect. So in our onCreate method, uh, the first thing that I like to do when I'm inside an onCreate and I'm starting to code the functionality of an Android view is I'm going to basically just get access to all of my elements. It's, it's a really easy like way to start our code. So first we're gonna get our increment button and we're gonna store that in a value. So increment button, it's of type button and it's equal to find view by ID r.id dot increment button, right? So we named our IDs nicely. So because of that, it's easy for us to find out like which IDs correspond to which views. So we can also get the increment text, uh, which is a text view. And that's find view by ID r.id dot uh, increment text. So yeah, this uh, that's pretty nice. And then the last thing we have to do is get our seek bar. So our seek bar of text seek bar is equal to find view by ID r.id dot seek bar. So you might have noticed that I didn't like explicitly add an ID to seek bar when I was doing the XML. And that's just because seek bar like automatically has an ID when you add it to um, when you add it to Android. So there we go. So you can see how when I, I named my IDs based on what they were. So it made it really easy for me to find out like which IDs corresponded to which views. So I didn't have to switch between the XML and the main activity constantly, right? I just knew because I named them things that made sense. So I really suggest that when you name your IDs, when you give IDs to views, you name them in a sensible way, right? That's really important. So, okay. So now we need to actually take our user input. So the first thing I'm going to do is set up a counter and we're going to have this, this is of type integer, right? Uh, it's a number. And we're going to start that off as zero. Okay. And then what we're going to do is on create. So when the view is created, we want the increment text to display the counter. So the way we do that is simply increment text dot text is equal to counter dot two string. Uh, let's see. 
yeah, okay. So right now the value is always zero, but we're going to add more functionality to it. But basically this just allows us to, like when we start off, we're going to set the increment text to the value of the counter. And we need this two string because uh, you might you might not be very familiar with types, but basically we have a number, right? But we want our text to be like words, right? So, uh, or like a string. So that's why we do this two string. Uh, and then what we're going to need next is we want to like code the functionality of our button and our seek bar. So I'm going to start with our button because it's a bit easier. So we're going to say increment button dot set on click listener. And now whatever code that we put inside here is going to run when the button is clicked, right? So this gives us a pretty simple way of uh, running this code. So the question is, so what do we want our increment text? How do we update this? So the first thing is that when we press the increment button, we want to increment our count. So the way we're going to do that is counter plus equals, and then we need some value to increment it, right? And remember that value was based off of the seek bar, but we don't actually have the code for our seek bar yet. So we're going to initialize a default value for this, and we're going to call it var incrementer, and this will be an int and it gets zero defaultly, right? So remember how the seek bar, the progress, it's the seek bar starts with no progress. So that is sort of like what we're doing here. We're saying we're starting off with an incrementer of zero. So we don't have any progress on our seek bar and we want to add the incrementer to the, to the counter. So whatever value we're incrementing by, we want to add that to the counter. And then what we have to do is update the text. So incrementer text dot text, is again, just equal to counter dot two string. Okay. Uh, and then the next thing that we want to do is code the functionality of our seek bar. So seek bar dot set on seek bar change listener. So this syntax gets a bit weird and I'm going to try to explain it for people who might've taken 2110. If you haven't taken 2110 yet, that's completely fine. But some of this stuff like might go over your head, but I'll go over the main ideas after, but I do want to give an explanation for those who have taken 2110. So um, yeah, so this is gonna be an object of type on seek bar change listener. And then what we're gonna do is you're gonna write out this line. So object colon on seek bar change listener, and you're gonna do these curly braces. And what you're gonna notice here is that object has this red squiggly line under it. And it's basically telling you that this object, like that doesn't meet the requirements of an on seek bar change listener. So an on seek bar change listener, it has to have these methods, right? We have to, we have to specify what are we going to do when the progress changes? What are we going to do when we start tracking the touch? And what are we going to do when we stop tracking the touch? So without, without these three methods, we don't really, we don't really, uh, we're not telling the computer what we want the seek bar to do. So we need these three methods. So with this red line here, right? The easiest way to get those three methods are to go to that red line and hit implement members. And like, luckily, right, our IDE is capable and we have all these members selected. So we hit okay. And that will give us the template functions for each function that we need to fill out as a developer. You can see there's all these to do's. We're going to have to do each of these to do's. Okay. So our first one uh, on progress changed. All right, and actually, before I go into that, I want to go into the syntax a little bit as well. So basically, um, like, uh, we're, we're basically passing in three different functions that we want our set on seek bar change listener to call. We want our listener to call these three functions, right? And the way that we pass in these functions, functions is through an object. And this object implements the on seek bar change listener abstract class. So uh, that again, like that might be a, a bit much. I can't go into e like every detail right now, but basically like essentially this object is, is an object that implements these three functions. And each of these three functions um, is a part of this on seek bar change listener abstract class. So that's a bit a more of the low level details. Like if you didn't really understand that, that's okay. The key idea is that you have to implement each of these methods for your on seek bar change listener. And we do it with this syntax. Okay. So first is on progress change uh, to do that. So let's, let's consider like what, what this, what we might put here. Right. So 
Remember, we're increasing our counter by the incrementer, and we want the incrementer to be based on the progress of the seek bar, okay? So does anyone want to try just like making a guess, just throw it out there, it's totally fine if you're wrong. Just what do we think like the line of code would be in this on progress changed? Anyone have an idea? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Incrementer, uh, very nice. So incrementer is equal to P1, right? Uh, do you want to talk about like, how, how did you know it was like P1 and not P2 or P0? Yeah, exactly. So P1 is that integer value I was talking about that's behind the scenes of seek bar, right? And we know that that's for an integer because like Kotlin is the strongly typed language. We talked about that a little bit in lecture one. So um, we know that this is an integer, right? And it wouldn't make sense to set counter to like a true or false value or like the seek bar itself, right? That doesn't make any sense. So we're going to leave it like that, okay? Then these last ones, on start tracking touch and on stop. So depending on the way that you're implementing your seek bar, you might want to have functionality for these. But um, all we really need to do actually is just change the incrementer to be P1. So what I'm going to do is get rid of this and just say, uh, do nothing, right? So this just shows that like we're purposely doing nothing. We didn't just forget to implement it. And what you'll notice is that if you try to leave this to do function in here, uh, it will actually crash your app. And the reason is that this to do function is a function that's like built into Kotlin that will, it will throw a not implemented error uh, if you leave it in your code. So, and you can even see that from the documentation, right? It throws a not inline error if you leave it in your code. So instead we're gonna just gonna get rid of it. And we're just gonna say that we wanna do nothing in these situations. Um, like we don't really care that they stop tracking the touch or start it. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So that should be all of the code. Uh, now we just pray that it works. <laughs> so let's, let's find out. <laughs> let's see. Uh, okay, we have an issue. Oh, this is a me problem. Um, don't, don't do what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, it's just like, whenever I start a new project, I kind of have to change the gradle up a little bit. So <laughs> yeah, if you're, if you're getting like an error like that, let me know. I can try to debug it for you. I think that should be good. Okay. Our text is really small. <laughs> I forgot to make it bigger. Uh, let's just make it bigger so we can actually see what's going on. So you can use text size for that. And let's just do 24 SP. So like DP is the units for um, like essentially like dimensions. Like it might be like what you think of as pixels. And SP is more specifically for text size. So I'm gonna refresh. And okay, nice. So let's try to increment. And look at that. So it just went up by 30 each time. Uh, and now we can change the seek bar again, right? And then increment. And now it's going up by 50. I got it exactly in the center. Wow, okay. Uh, wait, actually, let's see. This is going up by a whole number every time. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. That was just a coincidence. <laughs> I thought there was something wrong on my code. Okay. Yeah. So you can see that it goes up based on where the seek bar is. Um, yeah, there's 20 again, right? But we can go a little bit down and nice. Cool. Okay. So that is the demo essentially. Does anyone like have any questions about anything at all that we just went over? Does everything make sense? Uh, yeah, I guess since we have a little bit of extra time. Okay, yeah. Um, I was trying to think if there's something else that I should go over, but okay. Yeah, so I guess we can just uh, look at like the object syntax a bit more for now. So um, basically this object here, we're just passing in a parameter into the set on seek bar change listener. And what, what, this, um, what this method expects is it expects you to pass in an object, right? Some like some sort of object that contains all the methods that you need for a seek bar change listener. Okay. So we we pass in 
this object and this is essentially an anonymous class so if you know like when we have like class main activity uh extends this like app compat activity right that's a class and what's interesting is that we actually override this on create function um and this this function that we're overriding here is like necessary to this main activity class right so it's kind of similar in what we're doing here so instead of like typing out class like we could make a class for it we could say class seek bar change listener one extends on seek bar change listener we could make a whole class for that but instead we use this object which is an anonymous class so it's basically we're basically instantiating a whole class but we're doing it in a much like simpler and concise way so we make this object that has on seek bar change listener interface and then because it like it extends the on seek bar change listener it has to implement these three functions and that's essentially what we're doing there so yeah if you if you hopefully that makes like a little bit more sense now but um yeah cool yeah so when we pass in that object we're promising that it is an on seek bar change listener but in order to promise that we have to have these three functions otherwise it's not of that type and we're going to get those errors. So again, if like Zach said, if we wanted to create a whole new class for this on seek bar change listener, we could. But then every single time we created an object of that class that we just created and we pass it into a seek bar listener, a seek bar change listener, it would do, only do the same thing every single time. But if you have multiple seek bars, you might want to customize it so that every seek bar does something different. And that's why we don't create a whole new class is so that we can kind of customize what this object does and how it responds to that particular um, seek bar being changed. Yes, well said. Um, yes. I guess like another thing that you could try to do if, if you, if you want to do some extra stuff is maybe try making it so when you start tracking, the text size like increases. And then when you stop tracking, the text size decreases. So like whenever, whenever you're like tracking with this uh, seek bar, right, your text size gets bigger. And then when you stop tracking, it gets smaller. So if you want to try to do something on your own, that's like that's like a good exercise that you could do. Just practice like implementing these uh, different functions and stuff like that. So, all right. All right, if there are no questions, um, we have a couple of, well, I have a little bit of the announcements to go over again. Um, homework one, it's actually called homework two in the lecture because we wanted to keep it consistent with like the lecture numbers. So homework two is due October 17th. Homework one was the optional assignment that I um, bumped on Ed last week. So did anybody look at that or like try that one? Okay, sounds good. And then did anybody look at the seek bar demo that I posted on Ed? Okay, I mean, that's fine. But we're going to have this code posted. You also have those resources to consult for homework two. And then um, you all know the deadline is October 17th. And then anything else? Our next class will be on Monday. So that'll be our first Monday class. Yes. If you came in late and didn't join the Kahoot, um, just come see us after class to get your net ID checked off. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I guess that's everything, right? So if you want to, you can go early. Yes. <laughs> Make sure you're using the ed as well. I know office hours are a little bit inconsistent right now, but 